With me are Pastor Michael Thomas of Reform Fellowship Church. Hello. And Pastor Dan Branch of Grace Bible Fellowship. It's a beautiful morning. It is indeed. I'm your host, Dan Swick. Okay, the first thing we want to talk about today is the Christchurch, New Zealand shooting. Um, a man, an Australian man, killed 49 people uh, between two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Just this horrific shooting. Um, what the media have done generally is they don't want to, and you know, I think this is sort of understandable, they don't want to engage with this guy. They don't want to mention his name. They don't want to mention his ideas and stuff like that. But I think that in order to be responsible, we at least somehow have to engage with the ideas that he is invoking because he claims to be part of this Christian civilization. He he claims Christianity in a sense that, in a sense of, you know, what has spawned out of, you know, Greece and Rome and spread west and, you know, in, in terms of the Catholic Church And, you know, that is generally what we call the West or Christian civilization. And that is what he claims to be acting for. And we all know that that is different than the gospel. That is different than what we know as Christianity, not what people have done in the name of Christianity. So one of the things that first stands out to you about him, he says, Where are you a Christian? He says, that is complicated. When I know, I will tell you. Well, we know. We know he is not. It is very obvious from his actions. Um, one of the the two greatest commandments, obviously, is love your God with uh, all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He is not loving his neighbor as his self, to say the least. Well, he's not loving God either. I mean, that's yeah. Matthew 22 that you're quoting with uh, with the two greatest commands. When a, a lawyer, so to speak, comes up and tries to trick Jesus by asking him what's the two, you know, what's the greatest commandment, and Jesus answers him perfectly by giving him those two commandments, saying that this sums up the law of the prophets. And yeah, it's it's the relationship between you and God, and the relationship between you and others. And he was breaking fellowship and disobeying God's will in both of those and what he did. And what you're reading from there was his manifesto that I got a chance to look over it briefly. And, uh, you know, certainly nothing ringing in that manifesto, nothing in it was uh, screaming gospel, nothing in it was screaming Christianity, biblical, real Christianity. Um, And unfortunately, all it takes nowadays is for someone to say they're a Christian and all of Christianity gets lumped in with that person and their actions and their beliefs. And, uh, you know, it's it's an unfair criticism because people will use um, the defense against radical Muslims and say, well, that's just a radical Muslim. That doesn't represent Islam. Um, but it's not always the same with Christianity. A lot of times there's not that pause to say, whoa, well, is this a radical Christian who doesn't even, shouldn't even have that title? Or is this a genuine biblical Christian? But the world doesn't even know what real Christianity is about. There's such a, a small percentage of true biblical Christians out there um, and such a large number of apostate or cultural Christians who are Christian in name only and so, you know, what they do and what they say gets credited to biblical Christianity, even though it is not. It is. It is very different because we, you know, you can take certain passages in the Quran and, you know, certain things like uh, you need to oppress the people of the book, you know, meaning uh, Christians and Jews, etc. Um, you know, some some Muslim scholars will say, well, that's just like a spiritual thing or it's been... Uh, superseded by other passages something like that no this this goes directly against you know somebody who acts in in violence in this kind of way towards innocence is directly contradicting scripture oh yeah there there's no you know in when you try to equivocate between the two you're just being either ignorant or dishonest yeah well for some reason we think that we're doing god a favor by taking out the enemy where if you look at the first few centuries of the church, if you've ever skimmed through or read through Fox's Book of Martyrs, these were people who were killed for their faith, not because they killed 
the opposition, but because they were giving the gospel and living a true Christian life. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's the point, right? The ultimate showing of love for one's neighbor would be to share with them the gospel, which would be the one way they have to be made right with God and find forgiveness of sins and have eternal life instead of eternal damnation in the lake of fire. So the, the, the ultimate, the penultimate example of loving one's neighbor would be to share the gospel. That's even if they're pointing a gun at you. That's even if they're coming to, you know, if even if there's a legitimate thing where, hey, this, this group of rebels are coming into my village and they're going to kill every single one of us, right? As a Christian, my first thought should be, I need to share the gospel with them, even if it costs me my life, instead of, I need to grab my gun. That, I mean, that's that's just, you will die for your faith like Christ died for his faith and that many before you died for your faith. You die for Christ. You die for the gospel. You know, you don't see, um, you know, it's not necessarily pacifism as much as it is just obedience to Christ. I don't see myself as being a pacifist. I'm willing to fight for, for things that I believe in, but at the same time, I know the example that's been set for me in Scripture. And so if God has put me in that position where I must sacrifice my life in order to give the gospel to someone who may or may not accept it. That's what I'm supposed to do. And I think we can take the example of Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane um, with the Roman soldiers as Peter took up his sword to, quote unquote, protect Jesus. And, you know, Jesus not only stopped him, but he also healed the man that Peter had harmed. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's just it's it's like what Dan was talking about just a little bit ago that it is nothing what what this man did and what he wrote have zero to do with scripture have zero to do with biblical Christianity whatsoever you can take whatever title you want but you know if if you actually are being intellectually honest you have to say that this man does certainly and obviously does not represent biblical Christianity in any way shape or form even though he takes on that title. We have many people today who don't go out and create mass murders who take on the title Christian when they're not Christian either. Mm -hmm. I take offense at that. It, you know, it's quite easy to come up with a new name for yourself or a new title or a new brand instead of, you know, either you're going to agree with the Bible and then you can call yourself a biblical Christian, or if you disagree with the Bible, just be intellectually honest and say, yeah. you know what, I believe this part of the Bible, but I don't believe the other part. I'm not going to call myself a Christian, though. I'm going to call myself a blank, you know, something else that identifies yourself as different from what the biblical Christian should look like. There, there's another passage here that I would like to look at uh, in the Bible that is just fantastically inconvenient to him. Um, Exodus 23.5. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue him with it. Proverbs twenty four seventeen. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Romans twelve twenty. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him some to drink. By doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Mm -hmm. That means that you are to be loving and compassionate to your enemies. Yeah, and there's also Leviticus nineteen, which is you know an expounding on what loving your neighbor looks like. It's not just uh, the fakey kind of uh, cultural love that you see put out there today. It is loving, meaning meeting every need, helping with food, helping with you know everyday everything. And and that wouldn't just be. Um, it's not just loving them, saying, "Hey, like I love you. You can do whatever you want. And I'll never say anything against you." It's meeting the needs. It's helping. It's being present in their lives. It's yeah, if their donkey is, you know, overburdened that you help them. You don't sit there and laugh, right? I mean, a Christian would see that as an opportunity. Here's an opportunity to show unmerited grace and mercy and love the same way that I myself was shown unmerited grace, mercy, mm -hmm. and love. And and then as also an ex as a time to be able to then share the gospel. Just playing devil's advocate in this conversation, um, what do you do with, you know, and I'm not saying this guy had these thoughts, but it would be, to me, a logical conclusion for him. But when you go to the Old Testament and God sends the children of Israel into both Jericho and Ai and all the other cities that were enemies of God, 
and to utterly destroy them, you know, if this guy has in his mindset that God told him to go and take care of these people, um, you know, is there any biblical justification in that? No, because one, he he he, pre, he flat out says he doesn't even know if he's a Christian. <laughs> Secondly, his motivation is this idea of a white race of of a European people, and he is acting on behalf of the 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 European people. Never mind, he never bothers to qualify who the Euro- European people are. You know, is it okay? So he declares the Turks, the Turks as his sworn enemy. Okay, so there's two places, Greece and Turkey. There's a border there. Okay, like half of Paul's epistles were written on one side of the border and half of them were written on the other. Why, what is special here? You know, these are all image bearers, right. you know? But it's, again, this is just like what Dan was saying, Dan Branch was saying was, you know, it's it's a twisting of scripture and it's an it's an ignorance of scripture and to say that, oh look, this is the Old Testament shows that uh, God allowed the killing of men, women and children, and therefore it must be okay for me to thou thou kill men, women and children um, here and now. Well that's ignorant. That's ignorant. And that's a that's a twisting of scripture and it's an ignorance of scripture. And so that's just somebody looking for permission or rationalization to be able to do something that they in their sinful flesh wish to do. And so they'll find and make a God of their own choosing or a, um, you know, ideology. Right. And, you know, taking what they want from where they want to be able to make it into something that they wish. The scriptures are completely different than that. The scriptures are saying, look, this is God's own word to you, and you, it, you don't change his word. His word changes you. you. You know, he, in context, nothing in context with the stories of the Israelites taking over the land that God had given them is uh, can be referenced as an excuse to do what that guy did or to have the overall mm-hmm. goals that he outlines in his manifesto. They were being obedient to direct revelation well yeah and that's part of that the the context issue too that you know this is not something yeah that that happened yep that happened god did tell them to go and do that but it was god's you know specific command revealed command this is not something that that appeal it's not a uh, we talked about descriptive and prescriptive text in bible study this is not a prescriptive text to be used as an example of what you should be doing in the year 2019. It is a descriptive text describing the historical context of something that God did for his people. That would at least even be sort of, um, I don't want to say clever, clever isn't the right word, but that would be at least more a more direct appeal. What he does is, is he has this little passage called Two Christians, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's basically two paragraphs from Pope Urban, Urban II. Pope Urban II was the one who perpetrated the um, the first crusade against the um, against the uh, Seljuk Turks, and so when he's appealing to Christianity, he's not appealing to the apostles or to or, or to Jesus or to um, the early church in that sense. He's appealing to quote unquote Christian history, um, you know the 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 historic Catholic church that conquered and, you know, then tortured and pillaged and, and you know, this is a, this, a good, this is a good tie in too, because when you say, you know, the, the Christian church with Pope Urban use air quotes there because <laughs> that's not the true Christian church. Of course, yeah. And so much like how, you know, Christians, the general Christian universal church gets mm-hmm. blamed for the crusades, right? Well, no. The, the the biblical Christians of that day and age wanted nothing to do with the Crusades. They knew that it was unbiblical. They knew that it was not against that it was against God's will. That it was against His word. It were the people. It was the people who were faux Christians, right? They 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 took the mantle of the name Christian, but they truly were not Christian, and their fruit bore witness to that. In the same way, how the, the the Catholic Church were the ones that perpetrated, and the faux Christians of that day were the ones who perpetrated the Crusades, but yet all of universal Christianity gets blamed for it. It's kind of similar with this guy with the shooting. He takes on the mantle of Christian. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm a white Christian, 
And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he takes on that mantle. And so because he's a Christian, now you see the media jumping on that and saying like, whoa, 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 look at how much the Christians hate everybody and how dangerous they are. And, and uh, here it is. It's just a, a new round of, of crusades again. Very similar, you know, that, that, that true biblical Christianity gets lumped into this kind of stuff. The reason that happens is because there's very few biblical Christians. The world around them sees mostly carnal Christians. Mm-hmm. And so people who aren't even really Christian, but yet they bear the titles. So those people, they don't know the gospel, just like this guy doesn't know the gospel. He didn't yeah. know if he was a Christian because he wasn't one. And so he doesn't know right. the gospel. He's not. If he knew the gospel and accepted the gospel, he'd be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and there'd be signs of fruit and sanctification there. Yeah, the, he, he, he asks, he says, ask, he, he's talking to Christians here. He says, ask yourself, what would Pope Urban II do? And obviously, that's the wrong question to ask. It's not what a first or a eleventh, tenth century pope would do. It's what would Jesus himself do? Yeah. Yeah, he's Jesus. got the wrong bracelet, here, right? Yeah. It's not W W P U D. It's W W J D. And yeah, I mean, it's just again, it's it's the confusion. This is this real Christians having to deal with these issues is, I think, a, like a, a payment like a punishment for the fact that we don't, there's not enough of us. There's not, we don't do enough to stand out from the world. Hmm. If you did, if, if the, if the true biblical Christians were as vocal and were as, um, self-sacrificing as the first church Christians were, there would be such a difference between us and those cultural Christians that it would be almost impossible to connect the two because you'd be like, well, I'm a Christian. No, you're not. I know what the real biblical Christians are like. They're like these guys over here who are dying for their faith and they're, you know, bold in their witness and they live for, you know, for the life to come and not for this life, right? But instead, there's this blur that you can't tell the difference when that shouldn't be so. You should, we should be easily able to identify a genuine biblical Christian from someone who is just a professing Christian but who does not truly possess Christ. It should be super easy. And if it was, well, then stuff like this would still be equally tragic, but it would be easier to point out the hypocrisy and the fact that this person does not belong to the genuine Christian church at all. He belongs to the fake one. Yeah, this one is uh, sort of going to be directed to Dan because he's the one with a bunch of kids. (laughs) Uh, One of his concerns um, is natalism. The fact that, you know, in the West we're, we're not reproducing uh, we're just uh, falling in, in birth rate where everybody else is increasing. Well, again, I think if you look towards the Bible, not specifically the gospel, just the biblical message in general, the Bible has a very pro-natalist message. They see that, you know, can I, uh, if I can quote Psalm 127, uh, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his en- with the en- his enemies in the gate. Okay, so what we're being told here is that when we have children and we, we give them the gospel and they believe, they are going to solve our problem um, by simply being more witnesses to the gospel, right? I mean, if you want to... Well, we, we, we've bought into the lie that um, the quote-unquote church today is propagating that, you know, even if you spin it in a good way, we're in the, the end times, the world is getting worse and worse. Why in the world would you want to bring children up in this world? But what you stated is exactly the reason why we need to, so that we can, you know, have our lineage who are built with the foundation of the faith um, train up a child in a way which he should go and in the end he will not depart Um, we're failing in that aspect and you know there's so many different ways that we can justify not having children Um, the cost the time that it takes um, just you know so many things and um, so, yeah, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by not. Well, that's what God says. Be fruitful and multiply. It's part of the ordained. God ordains everything. He ordained the family 
for the purpose of propagating his creation, right? To make more babies and to have more people. And if you have an ordained family, and that, I mean, it's pretty obvious to note that Satan always attacks everything that God does. And so he attacks the family because he recognizes that the family is an ordained structure by God to create children and then to have that father and that mother raise up godly children who will then raise up godly children of their own, who will then raise up godly children of their own. And instead now today, children are a burden. You know, a, abortion is a right and it doesn't matter about you. I mean, everything about it is under attack. Everything about the ordained family structure is under attack. It's the same in the church. Another ordained structure that God has put together, that's under attack. Women pastors, um, you know, churches not being ecclesiastically set up in a faithful way to the, what the word of the Lord says. Um, people who are not qualified being put in roles of leadership. Um, but to get back to the family, yeah, you've got the, the husbands are under attack because you're being emasculated and you're being, your role is being diminished and everywhere in society, men are ignorant, men are stupid, men are dumb, men aren't necessary. Um, women are great, women are strong, women are everything. Women are great, women are strong, but it's, it's a, there's an attack on the ordained roles of men and women. And it's like what I always like to say whenever I talk about that is that men and women might have different ordained roles in God's plan, but they do not have a different worth. They have the same exact worth in God's eyes. So a man and a woman have the same spiritual worth as one another. However, God has ordained a different um, role for each of them. And it's much like the Trinity, where all three parts of the Godhead are co-equal and co-valuable and co-deity and co-everything, except they have different ordained roles. And if you attack those things in the family, you do away with... Um, you know, bit by bit, everything that has to do with what God has purposed and planned and, and commanded us to do, including childbirth. Right. So the, the way this guy looks at the world is that in order to solve this problem of declining birth rates, the first thing you have to do is, you know, get, get rid of all the quote unquote invaders. And then you have to get women uh, reproducing again somehow. Well, I think it's very, very obvious that a better thing to do would be to stick to the gospel and to do what it's and do what the Bible says and have lots of kids and be, be fruit, fruitful and multiply. And, you know, those problems will take care of themselves. You don't have to do anything hideous or violent. Or... Yeah. It shows his ignorance again of scripture and, you know, ignorance of scripture is not something to be proud of when you call yourself a Christian. His ignorance of Scripture shows that, you know, if he had some understanding of Scripture whatsoever, that would be his burning desire, right? If you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, hear the gospel, respond to the gospel by God's grace, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and then you are in the process of sanctification. And in that process of being made more like Christ, Christ is going, and God's Holy Spirit is going to lead you into his truth. And it's going to make you have this burning desire to be obedient, this burning desire to follow his word and do his abide in his word well this is his plan this is his wisdom his strength nothing about this talks about what god's will is nothing about this talks about yielding to god's will or submitting to god's will or god's glory which everything is supposed to be for uh, mm -hmm. so it means on to those who are ignorant of the scriptures they might look at this and and find it confusing but to but to those who understand scripture and who will take the time to take scripture seriously and see what it truly says using proper biblical hermeneutics this stands out like a sore thumb of, of how absolutely man-made it is and certainly not christian certainly not christ-like in any way shape or form the, the other thing too is just over the last six to eight thousand years of sin dwelling in in the world when God gave that command to be fruitful and multiply that was at the beginning um, God's design for mankind was also one man one woman and you know as Paul described the end of Romans chapter 1 and as we're living that out that was not the design so I mean, just to make a, a 
blanket statement today that everybody should have 10 children. I just don't know if we can necessarily say that. Um, I mean, there's people, you know, I want to be nice here, there's people who have no no business having any children, um, Christian or not Christian. Um, so we, we need to be careful. I mean, sin has destroyed us. Christ can fulfill us. Um, and and God's the one who gives the arrows to the quiver. So, you know, I think in a broad statement, God says, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, he's never taken that command back. He's never said, okay, now that's enough. Please stop. Or, hey, uh, be a little less fruitful. <laughs> he's never said any of that. But he mm -hmm. also does not give specific numbers for what he expects from every family. And so just like um, God does in all things, he is sovereignly um, sovereignly bringing, to about, bringing about his plan and purpose and his will. So for each family, um, however many children or however many few, uh, that is all part of God's <clears throat> sovereign plan. I think well, it's, it's the yielding to that, that that's the point. God is also the op opener and closer of wombs, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't have a, the ability to have children, mm -hmm. of course he doesn't expect you to have children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that should uh, be something to be. You know, in, just because you don't have biological children yourself does not mean that you can't participate and contribute in the raising up of children, how they should go. No, even use the example of... of you know, Christians themselves who are the adopted children of God. They have the exact same rights as a child who was born to him. Just as we see in Roman culture and Greek culture of the day, you know, that was the case, that you were not a lesser child. You were of the same value as the, as the legitimate physical born child. You were just as legitimate. You were just as valued um, legally and um, culturally. And so there was no stigma about that at all. I think part of the reason for the stigma that we have today is that that is something that benefits the enemy. To, to have a stigma about being adopted instead of being uh, physically born or being with your physical parents, well, that doesn't glorify God at all. It, it benefits the enemy. And I, I, one thing I want to make sure I say, too, is I'm thinking about you know people who hear what this guy is doing and maybe they have some kind of a soft spot to some of it you know like well yeah i do see how islam is dangerous and i do see how you know they do tend to move into countries and then start to take over and you know that's a that's a concern of mine what do we do about it if we're not supposed to do what this guy did obviously um well what are we supposed to do about it as christians you know well what you do about it is you do what you're supposed to do. this lends to what you were saying if you just do what the bible says you can trust that you know, everything will work out in the end for God's glory and according to his will and plan because he's on the throne and has always been on the throne. So what do you do? You do what God's word says, right? You you treat others as you yourself would want to be treated. You you abide in his word. You forgive others as you have, have yourself been forgiven. You learn the gospel so that you're and be comfortable with it and assured in it and be a disciple in it so that you yourself can then share it with others and you should have your life proclaiming God's gospel in everything that you do. Do those things. You know, show patience, show kindness, show goodness and self-control. Show the fruits of the Spirit in your life and in your everyday dealings with ever who it, you're dealing with. And then see how God uses that. You don't have to raise up arms. Our, our weapons are not physical weapons. Our weapons are of warfare are, are spiritual. And so that's how you... That's how you fight in this spiritual warfare is spiritually. Ephesians 6 would be a great place to start. If I can go a little bit against that, what I, what I think is that there is nothing, you know, the nation is a biblical concept, right? I mean, I don't believe that there's anything wrong necessarily with participating um, civically in terms of deciding, uh, okay, so this person has a sensible border policy and they're, they're simply going to figure out who is allowed to get in and who isn't, you know, based on, on certain risk factors. And, you know, that God has created government to, to bear the sword, um, you know, for justice. And part of justice is keeping safe those inside of the nation. That being said, when you know somebody from another nation enters your border, you are to treat him well. There, there is no exceptions to that, you know. 
and I, I think those two things can be true at the same time, that, yeah, sure. that you know, national borders can exist, they can be enforced, and there is no sin in that, and that you should also treat those well that, that enter your borders. Oh, the, the problem that we're having in the discussion for in today is you have one side that wants no borders, the other side is, betic- is um, what's the word? Um, they're being labeled as people who just want a solid border. That's not the case. You know, people who want a border, who want control, they want a border with doors. Yeah. You know, and that's not being depicted. Um, you know, it's just, you know, just close it off to everybody. That that is not. They just want something that's done within the framework of our laws that are already on the books. Well, and the, the concept of a nation, the concept of, of of sovereign borders and stuff, is a biblical concept. I think what a Christian has to do is recognize that, yes, God has ordained the government and the rulers of the government to be able to bear the sword and to be able to watch over that nation and. Their job is to be able to watch over that godly, in a godly way, right? And that's their responsibility to do that. But for a Christian, you know, that is, it's okay, it's biblical about about nations and borders and all that. But you apply that in the concept of what you know and, and, and see and read in God's word. So you apply all those things based on what you see in God's word. It's not wrong to, you know, I wouldn't leave my door unlocked and just let anybody come in through my house. I would want to have an idea of who's coming in and who's coming out just for the safety of my family. I have a role and a purpose as the husband to make sure that I protect my family. And one of the ways to protect my family would be to guard who comes in and who comes out of my house. So there's no there's no difference there. But how I treat people when they come into the house, well, you do that. How do I treat them? Well, I look to what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. And that's how I do it. So the practicality of it is biblical. And so, but there's nothing wrong with borders or, or with, uh, you know, having an, uh, a policy that, that is able to restrict who comes in and who comes out based on logical, uh, compassionate. I have a reason. little uh, a scripture here. Uh, Leviticus, Leviticus 19, 33 through 34. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing amongst you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you are foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Mm-hmm. So that would be a practical, like, hey, how am I supposed to treat these people once they get in? That's how. You know, you look to God's word. And so it's just a supremacy. I always want to make sure that, that and, and maybe that's where it, it I always want to make sure that God's word is what's supreme. Hey, what's the question? You know, here's the question. What's the answer? The answer is what God's word says it is. And so that it is authoritative in that way and all sufficient in that way and inerrant in that way. And, you know, you do that whilst also applying, you know, reason. Hey, it's reasonable to protect your borders. It's reasonable to limit who comes in and who comes out using reason and compassion and you know treating others as you yourself would want to be treated and also while you're obeying the lord and and doing what your ordained role is to do it is the ordained role of the of the nation uh, of the protectors of the nation to protect the nation so they have to do that just like a man protects his family by watching who comes in and out of their house absolutely so um, the very last thing i want to quote and this will be a quote from the the manifesto is i think that he raises a couple of issues a couple of final issues here that the bible does deal with uh this is an excerpt from a section he made called two conservatives religion what remains empty churches and full shopping centers drive through confessionals and no-fault divorce any religious ideal that stood between the wealthy and wealth generation was downplayed sidelined and quit quietly dismantled also, they could lie in their pockets without complaints or objections. So I don't really quite get the last part of that, but I do get the first part of it. I think he's probably saying something about about the rich exploiting the poor in the name of religion or something like that. But, you know, the idea of empty churches and full shopping centers. Um, he is correct in that materialism has replaced, you know, 
fidelity to God's word, to caring about what, what God's word says, mm -hmm. and that we have made an idol of, of capitalism, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I'd agree. I mean, you know, me and my wife, uh, my wife and I, um, we had four children naturally. We adopted five children. We had other children that were in in part of our family. Um, and we could not have done that had my wife worked full time outside of the house. Um, so there's a definitely a commitment there. Um, what was used to be traditional family, father working, mother staying home, raising the kids, um, that is all but destroyed in today's society. Um, you know, so and part of that is will, right? Oh, I mean, it's selfishness. Right. It's, um, you, you can't say, I mean, certain people, if you were like people who live on minimum wage, yeah, you're going to have to both work. That, that, that is just a thing. Um, but, a lot of times it's just like, well, we, we can get another car or we can get a slightly bigger house if both of us work. And um, you're putting those sort of material concerns over your ability to better manage your household or, you know, what have you with, with uh, one of you staying home. Yeah, most of, in the world itself, the way that it's run today, it doesn't do us any favors as things get more and more expensive. Um you know, it is very tough to live off of one income anymore, um, but it can't be done. Yeah. When I hear this, guys, the last points that you just read from the manifesto, what jumps out to me is this is just a man ranting about what he sees. And I think there's many people who, if you didn't tell him where that was coming from, right, you just read that to him and said, do you agree or disagree? Many people said, absolutely agree, because they see a problem and a hypocrisy between what they hear from some people mentioning of the Bible and what it says and, and the, what the church is supposed to be and what they see. So they're seeing hypocrisy between what they hear and what they're seeing. And but the so, answer fidelity. The right. answer is getting back to God's well, word. Well, right. And I would actually point out that, you know, all I'm saying is that what he's pointing out and what he's ranting on is the hypocrisy between what should be and what, what isn't. But he doesn't understand what really should be anyway because he's not really a believer. Right. And so because he's not really a believer, well, guess what? The reason why there's such a hypocrisy is because the places that you're looking to for an example of biblical Christianity are also hypocrites who are not true biblical Christians. Mm -hmm. A true biblical Christian will not stay in materialism. A true biblical Christian will say, you know what? Um, at some point, the Holy Spirit continues to sanctify you, making you more and more like Christ. And so when you're genuinely saved, there is always growth happening, whether it is a small amount or whether it's a large amount and whether it comes and goes at different amounts at different times. But there's always growth. And so if someone is stuck in, in materialism and they're like, boy, you know, God will not let them stay there if they're genuinely saved. He will convict them. The Holy Spirit will convict them. And there will be change. And every one of us have had something that we've talked about personally, you know, one-on-one -on -one or together about things where, hey, we've been convicted by this, so we stopped doing this, and we feel like, oh, that was a waste. We wish we had that time back or so on and so forth. Well, you were convicted. I was convicted because of the Holy Spirit. And so then it was not a maintained uh, materialism or maintain selfishness. It was something that was identified by the Holy Spirit, convicted by the Holy Spirit, and through his power, able to change and overcome it. But this guy's, you know, he's not a Christian. He's not talking about that, right? If he was a Christian, he'd say, these are the hypocrisies that I see today, and all these people who claim to be Christians are, your fruit tells me otherwise. And it, It's da -da -da. just so obvious that his context for Christianity, he sees Christianity as the Catholic Church. Sure. He, That's he why did, I mentioned... He, Bo Bourbon, you know. Right. So he, he just sees the, the utter hypocrisy of the, of the Catholic Church, yet using their sort of conquering impulses as the basis for what he looks at as Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's just like, okay, so obviously the answer isn't religion, it's race. You know, just kind of assuming that. He doesn't mm -hmm. even go into qualifying that. It's just like, no, the answer is getting back to the gospel. I mean, if he is deceived in, in his own mind into thinking he is a true follower of Christ, he will definitely be one of those that stand before Christ in the last day that says, look, I killed all these people in your name. And Christ looks and says, 
I never knew you. From me. I never knew you. <laughs> Obviously. Well. Well, Michael, I I just had one last thing to say about this topic, and that is that about race. And I know I've mentioned this to you before, but the idea that Europe itself has value is, I just, I think, a very flawed one because Europe was only given all of its material benefits. It was only ha- it only had the the gospel spread far and wide because God ordained it. He could have just as e- easily given it to Africa. He could have just as easily given it to what was North America. Then, you know. It could have spread it east into Asia. It is of no doing of Europe. Um, and to stand on the West and Western civilization as though this group of people is superior simply because they've been given all this this material um, prosperity, I think is very, very flawed, don't you? Yeah, it's another example of, or another sign that this person is not a genuine believer and who also does not understand what a true believer would believe, right? One of the things, one of the, the hallmarks of a genuine Christian is humility and humility and unity in spirit and in truth. So there is not a, uh, there's not a looking to oneself as a higher um, person or up on any kind of uh, having any kind of glory or any kind of uh, reason to boast at all. Um, none of us have any reason to boast, no matter what race you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your family lineage is. Um, all who are saved are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. And I think the other point that it, it highlights is the fact that if you go back far enough, all of us have the same ancestors. So, uh, you know, go back to Noah and uh, his wife and sons, or you go back to Adam and Eve. We all share the same ancestors, and I think a true believer in Christ uh, recognizes that, and I think a true believer in Christ will show the fruit of humility in their lives, Uh, maybe even if it's just a small kernel of humility, but it will grow and grow in their lives because that's something that the Holy Spirit um, does. I agree. Thanks. Okay, we're back. The second thing we want to talk today about is the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention sex abuse scandal. Okay, so a report was released by the Boston Chronicle. Um, talked about uh, over the course of 20 years, there were uh, 700 victims of um, pastors and elders in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, so the first thing most you know, secular people will draw comparisons to is the Catholic Church scandal, right? But I, I think that there there is a very large difference here, both in terms of magnitude and in terms of the the problems that caused this scandal. Uh, so, it, it, first, 20 years, 700 victims. So, we can compare that to the Catholic Church where, you know, there are hundreds, if not thousands of victims in very small regions that are reported, um, you know, all over the world. Um, obviously, I'm not apologizing for the, the, the scandal because it's awful. It is, it is tragic. But it, it seems to me that some of the systemic problems that we recognize in the Catholic Church, some of the unbiblical problems are different than the turn that than what we have here, which really seems to be an oversight problem. What do you think, Dan? I mean, first of all, if it was only one person, that's way too many. Right. Um, goes without but, saying. Yeah. Um, but it just it just goes to show us how sinful man is, and no matter how you dress him up. Unfortunately, people get into the quote-unquote clergy. Um, it's more for a job than it is for a ministry. Um, I think that highlights the, the, the real issue. The real issue is, is that the church is meant to be built upon Scripture. 
and the scripture is clear as to what the qualifications of elders or leadership in a church. First Timothy three, right? First Timothy three, uh, First Peter five, Titus one. Those are all. Those are the go-to texts to find the qualifications for elders, qualifications for overseers. It is very clear, and the reason it's clear, and the reason it's so stringent, is because it is vitally important to protect the church, to protect it as a pillar of truth. Uh, which you see in First Timothy 3, a pillar of truth, a buttress of truth. You can't have that when this kind of stuff is happening. You must exercise not only discipleship but discipline, and you can't do that if you yourself as the elder um, are not qualified and are not also exercising that yourself. And so you have this pervasive problem, which leads into what Dan was just saying, that you have many people who are in clergy who are not called they are not called. The only way you can meet the qualifications that are listed out in 1 Timothy 3, 1 Peter 5, and in Titus 1 is to be called and equipped by God's Holy Spirit. That's the only way. No man on his own could be equipped or equip himself for such a role and to meet those qualifications, which are quite honestly very, very difficult to meet only meetable by God's grace and his power. And so we have many people who are leading churches who are not called to lead a church. And so you have people who are not pastors leading places that are not churches. And this is the result. This is the result. If this kind of culture is built up into a church then, because the sinfulness, whatever it is, whether it's sexual immorality or whether it's thievery, whatever it is, the culture is allowed to breathe and live in that church. That sin is allowed to feel comfortable there. That is the last place that sin should feel comfortable. It should not feel comfortable at all within a church. It should, you know, people when they come in should know that there is going to be conviction. There's going to be reproof and rebuke. And whilst there's also discipleship and encouragement, that's a place for both a building up of righteousness and a confrontation of sin. But we don't see that. And most people have never been to a church that even exercises discipline as laid out for a church in Matthew 18. Many times I'll ask people, have you ever seen that done? And probably nine and a half out of ten times, it's a solid no. I've never seen that. No one's seen that. Well, that's because it's not being done. And that's usually because you have someone who's not a real pastor leading a not a real church. And so, yeah, they're not going to do that because it's uncomfortable and because they themselves don't want to address one issue and bring that up for many reasons, right? It might be for greedy gain. Well, I don't want to bring it up and mention something to Billy Bob because Billy Bob's a tither and we need his mm -hmm. money. And if Billy Bob leaves, well, his whole family might leave and we can't afford that, right? So then who's the focus on? You, your money, your greed, your comfort, instead of Christ, God's glory, righteousness. What do you think is the qualification to lead several churches? In other words, what what are denominations? Are they biblical? Are they are they sound? Is is, is something like the SBC, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the entire country, thousands and thousands of churches, is this biblical? I mean, we we call the SBC a denomination, but the SBC is made up of individual autonomous churches who just happen to give to a mission fund um, out of a portion of what the church brings in. Um, I don't, and correct me if I'm wrong, I do not believe the Southern Baptist Convention has any um, pull over any individual church to make them do anything. Um, I do know that they do have a very set, loose set of requirements. For example, the biblical man, uh, man and woman uh, marriage definition. That is, that is a requirement. There are, you know, just basic Trinitarian theology. Um, that is a requirement. So they do exercise some control in that way. And that's what makes this come out to be a scandal is that everybody lumps all these churches in as the SBC where the same stuff is happening in other churches all the time as well. Well, and even that 700 that's reported. Right. There's no doubt more than that that just has never been come to light or been reported because of various reasons, fear, intimidation, I don't want to relive that again, those sort of things. And then, yeah, I'm sure it's happening in every form of denomination, you know, around because, uh, you know, there is no perfect denomination. 
I mean, so, it, it's so different running running's a wrong word, but overseeing a church body today than it was 50 years ago. I just had um, an inspector come in this week. Um, the insurance company that holds the insurance on the building and premises and things like that. Um, you know, I have to have insurance on me as a pastor for counseling. Hmm. I have to have insurance on me and my leaders in case an allegation comes up for sexual misconduct. Um, you know, you see more and more churches today going to, you know, getting background checks on their Sunday school teachers and, you know, children workers. Um, it's just a sign of where we're living today. It's a sign of how many tears we have within the church. And like Michael said, if you're not functioning the church properly, you end up with more tears than you have. You can have as many chiefs as you want for as many Indians, but if the chiefs aren't real chiefs, it's irrelevant. It's it's and it, and it's and it's gonna whatever happens at the pulpit plays out in the church. It, it, you know, no doubt if you have a faithful man of God at the pulpit who is concerned about sin who is conscious of sin, who desires righteousness in his own life and in the life of those whom God has given him to oversee, that that's going to trickle down and you're going to see that in the church itself. So as the pastor goes, so does the church many times. And you might have a church that has several pastors, right? But, you know, those pastors are responsible to meet those qualifications. How can you stand up and preach and teach and say that the Word of God is important to this flock of people every single Sunday, but then you yourself not be interested in following what that very same Word of God says about the leadership of the church. You must be, or else you're being disingenuous. You're picking and choosing what it is that you should follow and what you shouldn't follow. And so I think there's a lot of hypocrisy there. The, the men who are faithful and who are genuinely uh, you know, interested in pastoring, you know, they're the ones who fight hard to to lead the church. They're the ones who are who are bringing up sinfulness, who are confronting it, who are creating a culture of a desire for righteousness and a hunger for God's word. Um, it's the ones who are not faithful, who are sounding more and more like the world every day. Five ways to increase your bank account. Ten ways to improve improve your love life. Um, you know, that sounds, I could read those titles on any magazine in the grocery store aisle, yet these are, these are titles to sermons, quote-unquote sermons. And so, yeah, I'm not surprised when a church that is of the world and, and really is just has the trappings of a church, but really underneath it's, uh, well, it's like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, inside, you, outside you are a whitewashed sepulcher, but inside you're full of death. It's the same. On the outside, it looks Christian. Hey, it looks like a church. But on the inside, there's nothing there. It's dead. It's dead, spiritually dead. And so I'm not surprised when this kind of stuff happens in those atmosphere, atmospheres. Um, it's bound to because it's that's going to be what happens in a place that's not following God's word. And that starts with the pastor. That's just the mandate that we have as pastors to ensure that we remain in the word remain that we remain filled with god's holy spirit that we're not allowing ourselves to drift um you know it's it's not that big of a fall to fall into any kind of sexual immorality that's why paul warns against it so much within scriptures and we need to make sure that our relationship with the lord jesus christ is where it needs to be. Well, and you should have such a value for your for your flock, understanding that it's the bride of Christ that you're dealing with. So, I mean, that's terrifying. It's terrifying that I'm watching over my Lord's bride. That's terrifying to me. And so, it, the same would go for any elder, even if it's not an elder who speaks as pastor. If it's an elder, you are held to the same qualifications, and so you must be uh, above reproach. You must not be greedy for gain. You must run your own household well. You must not be a drunkard. You know, First Peter 5 talks about how you should not, 
you know, you should be willingly giving yourself for the church and not, not lording over them, you know. And, and this is just not happening in churches today. And it's because you have many, again, it comes down to the true gospel and true Christianity and what that looks like. People are afraid to say this is what true Christianity looks like. People are afraid of stepping on toes, but you must. You must. Because there's so many people out there who fall into the, the Matthew 7, 21 through 23 scenario where they think they're a Christian, but they're really not. And so they're not saved. And, and that's, so. that's the, I, I keep going back to when my kids, probably early to mid 2000s, um, my kids used to watch a television show, um, Seventh Heaven. Um, I remember. It, it had a, you know, it was a pastor's household who in this is what the world would want and see that a pastor is he was a person that got up and gave a motivational speech um, every Sunday and counseled people with worldly philosophies mm -hmm. during the week sure. and the world probably loved him oh, yeah. but that's you know if you were to measure by Christ's standards that would be a, a, a red flag that you are not in him or of him because if the world loves you there's a problem mm -hmm. there's a problem or you know the world should hate you as it hated christ and if the world can't tell that you're christ-like and it loves you a lot there's a problem there right if the world is comfortable with me and i'm comfortable with the world there's a problem there because the scriptures go against the world and christ even warns and says like look they hated me they will hate you also just remember who it was that was leading the charge against Christ. It was the religious community. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, today we have so much um, that we need to get along with. Our, you know, ecumenicalism is, you know, just running rampant. You know, it, when we stand up for the truth, it will be the religious communities that... Mm -hmm lead the charge against us and that leads me into my next point which is the way to look at this versus the catholic church sex scandals uh the way i i conceptualize this is okay so there is a target um that a you know a good evangelical church should be and so many churches fall short of that for a lot of reasons and one of the, the 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 corrupting factors there are like you said people that have no business being in ministry um, people who are just looking for a job people who have their own selfish motivations and they fail to hit that target with the with the catholic church i see it as a bad rotten target one that has been corrupted in the first place um you know with with the, the church's terrible ecclesiology that, that just reaches back through history, just um, through this continual process of evolution, of, of straying from God's word, from um, in, you know, especially with the unbiblical priesthood and the, the, the way that that leads into sexual sin and how that sexual sin it is just sort of lived with. And, it, it's come, and over time, it just becomes part of the culture to so where... You know, there are reports coming out saying that the Vatican is 80% homosexual. You know, that this this bad, rotten ecclesiology is just why I think that the, the Catholic Church scandal is just so much more worldwide, so much more endemic, and so in, you know, well, if, if you want to take on with that, Michael. Well, I just think that the, the Catholic Church is... It's a cult. It is a false church. It is not a Christian church. It is Christian in name only. Uh, it is not biblical Christianity. For any, I grew up Roman Catholic, so I know quite a bit about it, and I've been through the entire process. But I can tell you with assurance that it is not biblical Christianity. It is a cult. It is a cult, and like many cults, uh, leads many people astray for many different reasons. And you're not going to find. Um, in Catholicism, I just think that it's a cult, and I don't expect to find truth there. You know, people might hear a little bit of the Bible because they will read some of the Bible, and God might open their eyes and ears through that, but he will be faithful to pull them out of it because it is a false church. 
And I think that in the same way, um, there are many other false churches that, even if they're Protestant, that there's many other false churches that are able to bear the name church and even able to bear the name Christian, but they are neither. And I think in any of those situations, you're going to find debauchery and sinfulness because there is no desire for righteousness and there is no indwelling of the Holy Spirit within those people leading the church, let alone the people who are there following the leaders of that church. The difference to me is, is that the Roman Catholic Church has been at it for many, many, many years. And so if I was to take an evangel in a fake evangelical church and do the same thing and had it be alive for the same length of time as the Roman Catholic Church, I think it would be just as debauched and just as sinful. But I think because of its longevity that the Roman Catholic Church has grown in its sinfulness and in the depths of its sin, which is what biblically you see. You see a singeing of um, you know, the conscience, so they don't, you know, it doesn't even bother them anymore. Their hearts, their hearts are hardened, and sinfulness grows more wicked and more wicked and more wicked. And so you, I think the Roman Catholic Church would be an example of looking at as this is what happens in any fake church that is allowed to continue onward, that there will be a, a, a greater and greater sinfulness growing within that body of people even though they claim to be Christian and even though they claim to follow Christ and to follow his word, you know, the, the fruit says otherwise. And the same would be in, in, even in an evangelical one. But the Catholic Church has been at it for so long that it's really had much more of an opportunity for it to be more debauched. And just taking the words of Paul, um, I mean, there's any of this stuff could have been in any believer's past. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul talking about all the sins, um, neither fornication nor idolers nor adulterers nor effeminate nor homosexual nor thieves nor the covetous or drunkards nor revilers nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he makes a very interesting statement. Such were some of you. So if... Even though this may be something that we were, when we're in God's ministry, when we are claiming to be a believer um, that is not part of our life because of the rest of this verse, we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that it remains is evidence of having not been washed, which would be the illustration for being saved. And so you have a bunch of people who are not genuinely saved believers. And so when this kind of stuff happens, I mean, you'll see stuff happen where a believer, can a believer sin and falter? Yes, right? But will it be habitual sin where it's consistent? No, that won't happen because that can't happen because it's God doing that miraculous washing and work within that person. And even more so with those that he calls to lead his flock which is why one of the qualifications is you must not be a new believer. Part of that is God needs time to wash you thoroughly and to grow you and to have separation between your old habitual sinful lifestyle and your new lifestyle. I mean, as, as pastors, as church leaders, we are the example of God to our flocks. What kind of an example do we portray if this is the kind of activity that we you're also the example to set how much value there is on Scripture. So if I stand before you every Sunday and I preach out of the out of the Word, but I don't live it, or if I preach out of the Word, but I don't put it into action as it says, like Matthew 18, for instance, with the, with with the correction within the church body, if I don't do those things, I am subconsciously, even if I'm not saying it directly, I am implying. And subconsciously so, and in some cases consciously so, I'm implying that this is just nice stuff to read. But you don't actually have to do all of it. Look at me, for instance. Heck, I'm a pastor. You don't, I, you know, and I'm not following this whole thing through, right? I mean, that's that's 
The Catholic so, Church is right. open about that, of course. Well, yeah, absolutely. They, they degrade Scripture. Yeah, because they want they want to degrade Scripture because to degrade Scripture means that they have more power then, and they're able to decree and decree and uh, and 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 say whatever they like because they're the ones that get to take according to their philosophy. They're the ones who get to take and interpret Scripture as they wish. Mm-hmm. I think the very the, this is to me the the most tragic part of these scandals and this is not particular to to any you know denomination or whatever it's just the fact that these people that that are victims end up being dispossessed of the christian faith you know they 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 were treated very awfully when they were young um, by the by, these people who were trusted to be men of God, and so they conclude because they were so mistreated that this is all just hypocrisy. It's nonsense, and so I want, don't want to, anything to do with it. And my, so it's just heartbreaking. Yeah, my hope would be in the Lord in that, as it would be with anybody that that the Lord would reveal to them that look, these people who did this to you are not believers. Hmm. They're not believers. So this is no different than someone in the world coming up and raping you or abusing you or doing some of these things to where, you know, it is not, um, that would help change my perspective if I was in the same position. When I, if I was to have that realization that, you know what, this isn't the church's fault, it's this person's fault. And, you know, that would make a difference to me. And again, I would... I would again, you know, pray and hope that such people who have been hurt by the church, who there are many who have been hurt, not, not, not necessarily by the Lord, who is the head of the church, but who have been hurt by someone or some people who are within his church, uh, whether they are, uh, you know, falsely in, their, in that church or whether they are church members who have faltered and sinned, um, that, that they would be granted... Um, you know, saving grace by God that to, to show them that this is, you don't put your hope in people, you don't put your hope in the church, you put your hope in Christ. You know, the church will be imperfect because it's filled with imperfect people. The, and that's not to, that's not to uh, denigrate what's happened. There should be, you know, church discipline, and it should be such a strong setup within the church leadership that these kind of things are impossible to happen. Should be impossible to happen. Well, we didn't know he was a registered sex offender. Well, the reason you didn't know he was a registered sex offender is because you don't bother to talk to your people at all. You're happy to talk to him on Sunday for an hour or a little less, but other than that, you're never close enough to them, talking with them, praying with them, in their lives at all, like you should be, and that's why you didn't know about them at all. And so, and same with anybody else in the leadership. You know, well, we had no idea. Well, it's 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 your job to know people. That's what you're here for. If you're not getting to know the people that God has brought into your flock and love them as he's loved you, uh, it just makes no sense to me. So, you know, there is a, there's something wrong there. And I think these kind of things like this highlight um, the problems within the church. But the true church itself will, is protected by God. It's created by Christ. It is equipped by him it will always prevail it will always stay you know always be true it'll always come out on top the gates of hell will not prevail against it um but again it kind of comes back to what we were talking about with the shooter in new zealand that there's a difference between those who profess christ and those who actually possess him there's a difference between a church that just calls itself a church and a pastor who just calls himself a pastor and a real genuine church with real genuine called eldership there's a difference. The, the problem is, is that the real is just so few and far between that it's like finding a unicorn. There's just so few of them out there. When you do find them, you grab on with both hands and hold tight because you've realized, oh, this is special here. But there's a reason why many people bounce around from church to church who are genuine believers because they're looking for that realness. But then there's many people who love these fake churches because they're fake too. All right. Well, I think that about does it for Pastor Dan Branch and Pastor Michael Thomas. I'm Dan Swick, reminding you that apostasy isn't an Italian dish. Bye.